Hey Griner School, welcome. This is going to be my fourth lecture series of how to master full ring. Uh, today I had planned to do a lot more slides, but it seems like I'm only going to have time to do two topics today, and that's EV of a river bluff and four bet bluffing. I'm not saying that you absolutely need these two skill sets to beat 100 NL, but it's going to be pretty important before you to move up beyond 100 NL, which is where I am. Uh, taking you guys right now. So let's go ahead and get started here with the EV of a river bluff. Uh, as you've hopefully you've been aware of now, you've seen my EV videos hopefully at least once. We know that the EV of any kind of a play is the EV of a fold and EV of a call, right? Uh, when you're bluffing on the river though, you're already assuming that we're going to be behind. And so if we get caught, uh, we're never going to win. Therefore our win percentage is zero. And so Usually this is amount win uh, times percent win uh, plus amount lose times uh, lose percentage, right? So if our win percentage is zero, that's going to knock out the entire left term of this equation, and our lose percentage is going to be 100%. So that kind of simplifies this formula down to these four terms right here. Uh, we know what the pot is going to be, uh, as we usually do in these situations, and fold and call percentage are related. So the only thing we really have to determine is how much we're going to bet. They're uh, also known as the amount lose. So let's say we have nine of diamonds here. We flopped a monster draw. You know, we ended up breaking all our outs here on the river. You know, the scenario goes, you guys know the scenario, we raise on the button, they blind call, we see bet, we get called, turn, we check through, and you know, we're facing a weak tight opponent here and text to us on the river. And the really only way we can win is is to bet. So we want to know like how much to bet here on the river in order for us to take down this hand right now. So let's say we have two different kinds of opponents that we're going to play against the situation. We're going to have a solid opponent and let's say an inexperienced opponent. Um, a solid op opponent at this level is going to be one who knows that we really can't hit the ace that much on this board, right? Let me go back to the other board. On this jack-10, 4-2 ace, we really don't have very many aces in our range because we did see bet the flop, right? Uh, we might have the ace, uh, the ace-high flush draw. We might have, like, ace-jack, ace-10. Uh, but otherwise, those are really the only two ace-x ace hands we're going to have. Otherwise, we're going to be checking behind a lot, trying to get turned on because we, we might be ahead if, if that is the case. However, if we did hit the ace against this opponent, how much would we like make a little bet against him, right? Or we're not going to make like a probably anything, any kind of a bet that is going to turn his decision one way or another, right? So we want to make a bet size that looks pretty inconspicuous, and usually a two-thirds bet size works out pretty well. And so when you're making, you know, a value bet of two-thirds of bet size, if we had an ace, then you'd also want to make the same bet size when you're doing it as a bluff. Therefore, you won't be able to get any kind of a read off you. Now uh, against less skilled opponents we can actually change our bet size depending on what we want to happen. Uh, so if we want him to fold then we would bet larger and if we w want him to call then we would bet a lot less. Now I think um, a lot of players are, are familiar with this uh, with this concept that or, you know, I think a lot of us actually play that way where it's like you know if somebody bets pot on the river we're going to be calling inherently less than let's say if somebody bet uh, a third the pot size, just because the odds that we're getting is less in general. All right, so let's go ahead and calculate the break-even fold equity of a two-thirds pot size bet. Let's go ahead and s assume that pot is 15 big blinds. Uh, that's pretty much what like a 3x preflop raise and a call, and then a c bet and a call is going to give you right around 15 big blinds. 15 big blind works out to a pretty round number for this example. Uh, so the pot is 15. We're going to be betting two thirds of the pot, which is 10. And so the EV of a fold, the EV of a of this bet, we find a break even fold equity. We set it to zero. And so the break even fold equity, fold percentage, I'm sorry, is 40%. Um, so essentially, when we bet two thirds of a pot, our opponent must fold 40% of uh, of the time to be break even. I don't know why that says for our bet. Yeah, I guess that's right. Um, and this happens anytime. Anytime you're ever going to bet two thirds of the pot, your opponent must fold 40% when you're bluffing. Which actually isn't all that much, right? But is it going to be the most correct play? Uh, 
let's see here. Weak 10 opponents calling range on the flop and getting to this river on this board. I'm giving him some weak, you know, some aces, like maybe ace, ace king offsuit who decided to not uh, re race pre flop. Um, but I actually didn't put it in his range on here because I usually do think that you're going to re race ace king pre. Uh, like a jack x, 10x kind of hands, flush draw, and a straight draw are all going to be like checking, checking the flop. And maybe checking the river, maybe betting the river too, but we can really know what what he's checking the river to in the situation, right? So let's say he had he has like ace queen of diamonds, um, he might check this river, ace seven of diamonds might check this river, uh, king jack, king ten, queen nine, queen ten, queen jack, you know, miss straight draws. These are all the kind of combinations that he's going to show up with on this river. Um, that if we check behind, most of them, if not all of them, are going to beat us. I guess we might split with nine eight suited, which. Is a very small percentage of the time, All right? So we gotta make a bet size depending. You know, we got we gotta fold out a lot of these combinations here. So what's a good bet size to do that with? Um, our opponent's range is what we gave up here. Uh, I've gone ahead and added up total combinations of that range, right? So we ace queen of diamonds and, and a seven diamonds each have one combination in their range. King jack, king ten, queen nine, queen ten, and queen jack actually all have three. Actually, nine eight suited as two because um, there are one. There's one blocker missing from each of these, right? So the jack of diamonds is missing. So there's only king of clubs, jack of clubs. There's clubs, hearts, and uh, spades left for the king jacks um, and the king tens. For the queen nine, there is the same because we have the nine of diamonds. The queen ten is the same. Queen jack, nine eight suited. There's still three because there's. You know, we only have the diamonds gone. So those all all those combinations add up to 59. When we bet two thirds of the pot, we're going to assume that he's going to call us with any ace and any jack in this scenario, which is 26 combinations. If we add up, if we take away the combinations here that uh, aren't an ace or a jack. All right. So let's say we want to bet full pot. You know, we want to bet 15 and a 15. He is going to call us with ace x and king jack only right? which is only 14 combinations and let's say we want to bet twice the pot 30 big blinds and he's only going to call us with ace x uh, or any kind of slow play hands but uh, we're not going to assume he's going to be slow playing on this board so let's go ahead and calculate the ev of our of our bluffs here real quick right so what i've done here is i put the ev general ev equation for each kind of a bet all i've done was change the final bet size 10, 15, and 30. Uh, and I'm going ahead and calculated the fold percentage in each, in each one of these. So when we bet two thirds, he's folding roughly 56%. Yeah, that's right. Because actually, when I calculated this, yeah, that's right. Okay. So uh, it's 1 minus 26 over 59, just because 26 over 59 is the number of calling combinations here. So you gotta, you gotta keep that in mind where if he's calling with ace x and jack x, he's actually gonna be folding 33 out of 59. So that's where this number comes from. Uh, same thing for the EV of a, of a full pot bet, full percentage 76%. And when we bet twice the pot, he's folding 97% of the time. So let's plug these numbers in and you'll see that as our bet sizes increase, you know, the EV of a two-thirds bet is about four big blinds. The EV of a full pot is eight big blinds. And the EV of a 2x pot bet is almost well, is a over 13 big blinds. So as you can see, the difference in EV between these two bet sizes is nearly three times as much when we're willing to risk 2x the pot bet. So we're almost achieving the maximum EV possible, which is 14.49, which is only possible if he folds 100% of the time. So in this case, I've gone ahead and taught you guys uh, how to calculate the profitability of, of a bluff on the river. Um, 2x the pot is going to be the best size against the situation because he's, his hand range uh, depends solely on what we bet, on how much we bet. Um, we're also assuming that our opponent didn't slow play. Uh, against more thinking players, you know, we're, going to, we're actually only representing exactly king-queen. It's undoubtful that we actually would bet two thirds with ace jack. It's even unlikely that we would do it with king, with even king queen, because we want to get value out of our hand. 
but some but some players just look at there and they're like, holy cow, I don't want to risk that much, so they're going to go ahead and fold. Keep in mind, though, if we get caught bluffing like this in this situation, uh, we can actually value bet a wider a wider range the more we uh, if we get if we, if we ever do get caught. So I think I'm going to go directly into four betting, and I'm going to slow it down a little bit because I think I'm going a little too quick here in the situation. Uh, so we go ahead and the EV over four bet is going to be the same as we normally do. The EV our EV equation here is pot times fold percentage plus call percentage times the uh, the EV of a call there. And so let's go ahead and give ourselves some assumptions that our opponent re-raises us to 4x. Uh, he never is going to call us when we 4-bet. He's either going to 5-bet all in or he's just going to fold. All right. So assuming that, uh, when he does shove us here, the our win percentage is going to be 0 because we're never able to see a showdown. And so therefore our amount win is also going to be 0. Uh, and our lose percentage is going to be 1 again. And as with river bluffing, uh, the amount we lose is going to be based on our 4-bet size. So I've gone ahead and set up a scenario here where we raise 3x on the button, uh, the small blind folds, and the big blind goes ahead and makes it 12 to go. All right, so that's going to give us a complete pot size of 15.5 big blinds. And just like previously, fold percentage is going to be x, call percentage is 1 minus x. So in a sense, how much do you think we should re-raise to? Uh, I see this a lot at the 100 NL levels, where opponents, you know, they're going to be four betting. They four bet to to some ridiculous size, like uh, 35 big blinds, four big, bl 40 big blinds, even like 50 big blinds, and it's just like an LOL kind of. Someone who hasn't done the math before um, should know that the the higher that his four bet size is the less profitable the 4-bets is, is in general as a bluff, right? So, one thing I want to bring up is if opponent never does call us, uh, his 5-bet shoving range doesn't really change based on how much we 4-bet. Um, now, potentially, you know, if we make it 3x to go, he makes it 12. We could min re-raise him up to 21. Uh, maybe, I think actually that's 20, right? To min re-raise at 20. Uh, and we're actually going to get calls that way. And that's actually a completely different dynamic that uh, I don't even know where to begin to cover on, so I won't I won't go into that. But we kind of have a few different bet sizes to make, given that he made it 12. Um, some people argue you could make it as little as 25. I almost think that's a little too small. I'm like making it 25x when our my opponent re-raises it to 10. So let's say we're on the cutoff, he's on the button, we make it 25. And... So we're being uh, in position here, we kind of have a few different bet sizes that we can make. 27, we can make 30, or we can make 35. Uh, what do you think is going to be the most profitable? Let's go ahead and go through these as well. Doing a lot of the EV equation here. And given these equations, we've got kind of a similar equation as we had before. We have the pot size. All I, did, all I did was put the the different bet size in each one, and I worked through the, through each equation. Uh, what you're going to see is that the break-even fold percentage is all going to be plus or minus four percent here, around the 65 percent marker. Uh, so if we make 27 big blinds, he's got to fold only 63.5 percent. If we make it 30 big blinds to go, then he has to fold 65.9 percent. And if we make it 35 big blinds, then he's going to have to fold 69% of the time. All right. So what this means is, the more we risk when we 4-bet, the more our opponent must fold in order for a play to be plus EV. All right. Or actually to be, equal, to be the same EV had we made it less. So, our, but however, I mentioned earlier there that our opponent's 5-betting all-in range is d independent of how much we make it. So they're risking less is actually inherently going to be more plus EV. Uh, let's just go ahead and say, give you an example here. Let's say our opponent is going to be re-raising us and then folding 75% of the time. Well, depending on our bet size, I don't probably don't even have to go through all these equations, but I did. We, we're going to see that 27 big blind is going to be the most plus EV play to begin with, right? 
We're, we're making almost five big blinds every time we make this play. Whereas, increasing another three dollars here, we lose point seven big blinds, and another five dollars, we we lose another one point three big blinds. So, even though the fold equity doesn't actually change, or the break-even fold percentage doesn't change much between the three bet sizes, as you can see, the profitability matters greatly, whether or not we make it twenty-seven or if we make it thirty or thirty-five. So let's go ahead and go back to our fold percentage here couple slides back, right? So we know that 63.5 is break even for the 27 big blind marker, and we're going to know how to use that probably for the majority of this lecture. Um, if you guys remember back to the previous How to Master uh, Part 3 lecture, I talked to you guys a lot about the bluff to value ratio, right? Uh, and I said that the 2 to 1 bluff to value ratio is the most exploitable ratio, or unexploitable ratio that, there, that we can give. Um, that is because it makes a 4-bet not profitable, right? Because if someone's 4-betting us, and we're folding 67% of the time, there is almost very little profit to be had here to a 4-bet bluff, especially if he's making it 3 big blinds to go. So, if we're giving that way, that kind of reduces the motivation for our opponent to actually 4-bet us when we're 3-betting at only a 2 to 1 ratio of bluff to value. So, where can we get this information at to make our lives a little bit easier? Um, well, luckily, Hold'em Manager is there is there for us. Uh, if you make up, if you pop up the pop-up window when you're playing against somebody, you're going to see these stats, right? Uh, Eighty-five percent fold fold a, fold a small blind to steal, and you're also going to see that uh, he is three betting ten percent to steal. Now, I'm not going to deny that these stats don't look eerily sim uh, familiar to one of the Griner School instructors on Griner School. Um, I'm not going to say who he is, but these are one of the guy's stats over a pretty large sample. Alright, so, as you can see, he three bets a lot out of the blinds. Um, and so, what kind of, like, how often is he bluffing here, right? So we know that he's re-raising queens and ace-king all the time, and that's going to be roughly 2.6%. So really, the other 7.4% in the small blind and 6.4% in the big blind are going to be bluffs. But just because he's bluffing doesn't mean he's necessarily uh, exploitable. But until we do the ratio here, he's almost doing a 3 to 1 ratio in the small blind and 2.5 to 1 ratio in the big blind, whether it's intentional or not. That is what he's, that is what he's doing. Um, so that just means he is exploitable and we can format bluff him pretty profitably. Uh, let's figure out the profitability here. You know, if he's folding 71% of the time in the big blind, then we make 3.18 big blinds for every time we 4-bet. And if he's folding 74% of the time from the small blind, then we're making 4.45 big blinds from, to a 4-bet. When we risk 27 big blinds. Uh, so let's go ahead and find out, you know, what's the minimum 3-bet three, three percentage uh, if we're going to 4-bet? Well, 2.6% per value is is the value range. We're going to multiply that by 2 for the bluff, right? So, when you add the, the value and the bluff range together, you're going to get 7.8% total. So, when you look at your opponent's stats right here in this yellow box, and you see 7.8% or higher, usually I use 8% or higher, then you know you can actually 4-bet bluff them profitably. Especially when you're only making it 27 to blinds, alright? You can probably four bet a little bit less if they're I mean if they have like seven and a half percent at twenty seven big blinds and it's probably going to be break even just because of the break even fold percentage is going to be going down. So how what kind of a range should we actually four bet bluffing with in this situation? Well we're we know that our opponent's five bet shoving range for value is going to be queens are better and ace king. Um, and really, we want to we want a hand that's going to reduce the chance of him having any of those hands, and it's going to be a term that we call a blocker. And now, the definition of a blocker is pretty much when we have a hand, like let's say we have a hand with an ace in it, it makes it less likely that our opponent has such a hand with an ace as well. So essentially, you know, we block him from having as many aces. So if I give you guys an example. Um, 
our opponent three bets us to two and a half one way ratio. This should say three bet, not four bet. Let me go ahead and change that. So our opponent is three betting us with a two to two and a half to one ratio, and he's stacking off with only queens are better and ace king. If we had our choice between four betting him with ace nine suited or nine eight suited, which one would we want to choose? Right. So he'll have sixteen combos of ace king, and six combos each of queens are better when we have 9-8 suited for a total of 34 combinations. But when we have ace-9 suited, we take out four of his ace-king combinations and three of his pocket aces combinations, um, so he's only going to have 27 combinations left. So when we have a hand like ace-9, our opponent is going to have 20% less value hands in his range when we have the one blocker. Uh, so we should probably make our range up almost exclusively of hands that actually have a blocker in it. So, theoretically, we may be able to 4-bet every time our opponent would 3-bet us and have you profitable, but we don't really want him to adjust to us and start 5-bet bluffing, um, and that would be pretty bad because we don't want to give up the, such a such a good profitable play, even though we could then readjust and start 4-betting him for value more, um, but that's going to be pretty unlikely too because at the stakes you're playing. All right, so our own 4-bet for value range... And, you know, 34 combinations, queen are better than ace king. Uh, we can, if we use the bluff to value ratio of two to one as a guide, like we did for the three betting. Again, it's only 68 combos. Now, I wouldn't recommend doing like the entire 68 combos. Probably anywhere between 34 and 68 would probably be okay. Uh, if you start four betting too much, it could come around to haunt you, like I mentioned before, with the our opponent adjusting. Um, but in the end, you know, as long as you say two to one or lower, I think you guys should be okay. I know, well, let's see, before we start talking about 4-bet like, bluffing, like we did with 3-bets, let's go ahead and talk about what we're going to be calling a 3-bet with. Um, I know that playing in 3-bet pots for a lot of full-ring players, especially when they're calling a 3-bet pots, uh, a lot of players can't play in them correctly, and I know it's the case because we just don't handle situations as often as we do in other, other scenarios. And a lot of players even actively seek to avoid 3-bet pots just because they can't play them profitably. Um, but... As you, as you improve as a player, you should be able to play better in position. Um, and one such hand that is probably one of the most debatable on how to play in a situation like this is going to be ace-jack offsuit, right? Um, a skilled player would probably be able to call this profitably versus somebody who's three betting a wide range, possibly polarized, you know, being able to, to bluff post-flop, you know, um, float when necessary. However, an unskilled player would not be able to call all that much, right? I mean, and I actually expect a lot of Ryan School members to be in a, in a scenario where they're not going to be able to call ASEC offsuit profitable just yet. You know, they're not really too familiar about it. Um, they're not familiar with how to play post-flop in a lot of situations. Now, does that mean you should always never, you, know, you should never play ASEC offsuit post-flop? Uh, no. Actually, I like you guys trying to take risks and trying to find a way to play a hand profitable. However, that said, like any hand that you can call properly to a 3-bet, uh, we should do so in order to protect our 4-bet bluff range. Um, now, I, I want to be able to explain this a little bit just because this is going to get pretty confusing um, pretty quick. All right, so let's just say here we have a sample of a million hands, and we blind steal you know, XX on the button, and we get 3-bet. Uh, we're pretty much we're going we're to have four options. Right? We're going to fold the hands that just aren't profitable anyway. Right? We can 4-bet bluff. Or, I'm sorry, we can forfeit for value the hands that we're going to stack off with. Uh, Queen's better and ace king. Uh, we can call with hands that are going to be profitable to do so. And we're going to forfeit bluff with hands profitable to do so. Right? So just think about like your entire range for a second. From anywhere from like 7-2 offsuit up to pocket aces. Think about your entire range of hands that you can play. Now keep in mind that like a forfeit bluff range and your forfeit for value range are all related directly to each other, right? So we base how often we can bluff on how often we bet for value. Uh, if we were to then take a hand from our calling range and move that over to our value, or I'm sorry, our bluff range, um, then it actually reduces the total number of hands that we can play to a 3-bet, right? So let's say we have, you know, we have 34 combinations that we can raise for value. We're going to be able to bluff 68 combinations. 
Uh, this is assuming that we were already going to call. Well, let's say we're, let's say we call you know, sixty combinations of hands between some mid pairs and you know ace queen type hands. Let's say we have fifty combinations of that. If you were to take a hand like, uh, you know, pocket nines, and take that from your calling combinations and, and put that to your bluffing combinations. And the total number of combinations that you would play as a whole part of your range would then decrease to when you, when you get 3-bet. Um, and essentially, when in order for us to remain the most profitable against our opponent who's trying to 3-bet us a lot and therefore make our opponent unprofitable, is that we should play the most number of hands in our range for profit that we possibly can. So therefore, that's the reason why, even though, like, let's say a hand like Ace-Jack, it might be more profitable for us to 4-bet Ace-Jack uh, as a whole, right? But it's going to be the same profit to 4-bet Ace-Jack as it would to, say, 4-bet a hand like Ace-2. Um, so essentially, you know, we we don't want to be taking Ace-2 out of our range to 4-bet Ace-Jack when inherently Ace-Jack has some value to a call with it. And like I said, it's a little bit confusing, and if you guys have any questions on that, please ask on the forum what your question is directly uh, and we can see if we can work through the thought process here. So let's go ahead and go through our range now that we have the frequency down. Uh, we're going to format for value, queens are better, and ace-king. Uh, we're going to be calling a three bet probably, you know, I've mentioned a couple mid-pocket pairs, nines through jacks, potentially maybe even eights. Um, Ace Queen, I don't think we could ever really, you know, if, especially in position, it's hard for us to fold a hand like Ace Queen against a loose three better. Ace Jack suited is gonna be the same way, same as like King Queen suited, and you're gonna even have like even more in your in your in your calling range there if you are a heads up or a six max player and you're watching this. So what are some good hands to the format bluff? We're looking at hands that are too strong to fold but too weak to call with for one, and we mentioned that we want to have a blocker. Uh, so against players who can't call ace jack offsuit ace and offsuit profitably, we're actually going to want to turn those hands into a bluff and four bet those guys. So that's 24 combinations. Uh, we're going to take the suited aces there. Let's re raise every time you get a suited ace. That's going to be 36 combinations. And let's just say for the heck of it, you know, ace and offsuit two thirds of the time for eight combos. And I mentioned, you know, in my previous video, lecture video, where it's like. If you don't know how to determine frequency, just use the, the clock or whatever, you know, if, if, you're, if your second hand is that 40 seconds or lower, then, you know, you would 4-bet it, and if it isn't, then you just don't 4-bet it. And and basically, I just put that there so I can get an easy 68 combos. That ace and offsuit could have just could just as easily have been, uh, you know, ace and offsuit one-third, ace eight offsuit one-third equals eight count balls as well. So you know develop your own range yeah. in that in, in, in this in this case if you if you if you must. So uh, as a whole here we're we're gonna be wrapping up the this four betting uh, this this four bet bluff series here. Uh, versus a three bet we're going to be calling with pocket nines and pocket jacks. Uh, ace queen and ace six suited and king queen suited that is 3.2% of hands total. Um, we're going to be 4 betting 2.6% for value and another 5.2% for bluff, right? So essentially that's 11% of our hands completely that we're, that we're raising. So let's say that we blind seal 40%, right? And we have these hands. Um, we're going to be folding to a 3 bet 72.5% of the time. Now if that seems like a lot to you, well you could always add more hands in your calling range. Um, or you could potentially even format bluff even more as well, or or you could how do you, uh, just don't blind steal as much, right? So if you if you were to adjust your blind stealing from forty percent down to thirty percent, and you have the same calling range, uh, you would then only fold to a three bet probably like around sixty five percent of the time. So your fold three bet there depends solely on how much you're blind stealing and how much you're playing to a uh, to a three bet with. Uh, I'm actually going to go ahead and load up my uh, Eevee of a C-Bet lecture right now. I didn't think I was going to have enough time to go ahead and go through this, but it looks like I'm going to, so I'll give it to you guys as a bonus.
so I will be right back. Hey guys. Alright, uh, so good thing we have some time here, because I had this lecture of extra math and CBETs, and I really didn't know where the heck I was going to fit it in at in this lecture series, and so this is actually a good opportunity for me to do so right here. Um, so let's go ahead and move on, and we know the EV, we know our EV, our EV equation pretty well by now, hopefully, and there are two factors in determining the EV of a CBET that that really changes every hand, and that's going to be the opponent's range that he has, both pre-flop and on the flop. Um, and how much equity we have when we're called. Now this is going to be a little bit different than a lot of scenarios um, because his actually his opponent's hand range changes based on both the flop that comes and the hand that we have um, and so does our equity change. So it's not simply just like a one on equation like the one we just did with the 4-bet uh, the 4-bet bluffing and we're just only substituting out a couple numbers there. These little um, see what equations can get pretty complicated pretty quick. Now we're going to use a standard situation here, trying to figure out a value of a c-bet against you know an unpredictable range. This doesn't seem to do as well as someone's range that you can properly predict. Uh, so let's say we're going to do a lot of our c-betting against the tag, and and you know we're going to we'll go from there. So we have queen jack offsuit in the cutoff, raise it three x, and our opponent calls us in the big blind. Um, let's just say that we have an extremely large sample on him, 50% VPIP, 10% preflop, 3% 3-bet percentage, and a 10% cold call from the blind percentage, right? So all this information is actually available to you and hold a manager. Uh, we're essentially going to give him a range of, you know, twos are better, ace-10, ace-queen suited, ace-king-jack suited are better, queen-jack suited, jack and suited, 10 suited, 9 suited, Ace check to ace queen and king queen offsuit. And if you guys want to see what that looks like on uh, poker stove here, I will go ahead and bring this over. Uh, our opponent is going to be three betting us majority of the time with queens are better and ace king, right? So we take those out of our hand out of his hand range. Uh, he might also three bet some of these smaller hands as a bluff. So when you see a like, tag calling out a position like this, this is going to be his usual hand range you're going to see. It might be a different 10 percent from somebody else. So let's say this guy decides to, you know, fold 9/8 suited, but then call Jack 9 suited. It's all going to be pretty similar in terms of percent-wise and whatnot. All right, so we're going to go ahead and use this as our basis for this example. So when our win percentage when called when we, when we see that, you know, depends on both the flop, the hand that we have, and our opponent's calling range. So the more equity we have when called, the more profitable actually a C-bet is. And actually, that's true with any bluff that we make. The more prof, the more, well, any bluff that isn't the river, right? Because we already went over river bluffing. But uh, the more prof, the more profitable any bluff depends almost directly upon how much equity we do have. So we're going to give ourselves two examples here. Uh, we have queen jack offsuit, remember? Um, so we have a against his range of 10% of hands. And it, we have one flop texture of ace king seven rainbow, and another flop texture of two three four two suited. So, what do you guys think is the more profitable board continuation bet? Well, let's go ahead and give ourselves a couple of assumptions, right? Well, we're going to assume that our opponent isn't bad, as we've already labeled him a tag. We've also made a lot of conservative adjustments, as we don't want to overestimate anything, right? We want to make sure that assuming all else is true, you know, at worst case scenario, this is what he's folding, I guess I should say. A, we're also going to assume a tag is not folding on the flop, and that is including either raising or calling us, third pair or better, or a gut shot draw or better. So that pretty much limits his range to what he's going to be calling the flop see that with, right? So let's go ahead and do, you know, example A right here. We have flop texture of ace king seven rainbow. Now actually I'm gonna go ahead and say I've actually done this with a few students before, and they found it immensely helpful in their continuation betting. And I would go through this but with this myself, you know, if you if you ever wonder if a C gonna be profitable or not with with your given hand with the given flop texture, go ahead and do this what we're situation, do these calculations that we're gonna be doing. 
uh, in just a few minutes, right? So we have Queen Jack offsuit, board is Ace King Seven Rainbow. Right, we already know that this is his range preflop, uh, and he's going to be either calling or raising on the flop with um, a set or better, or, or you know any third pair. So I guess any seven or better um, top pair. We'll say gut shots with the Queen Jack Jack Ten, as well as these you know good strong top pairs. So, in order for us to get the folding percentage in the EV equation, we actually need to count the total number of combinations that he's going to have. Uh, so, let's go ahead and count the combinations for his total pre-flop range, right? So, this is the range that he has seeing the flop right now. This, is, this isn't the hand range that he is seeing the turn. This is the hand range he has seeing the flop. Um, keep in mind, they also change in each flop, and that depends on our hand holding, the hand that we have. Alright, so with, you know, twos through jacks, um, pocket eights, no, I'm sorry, pocket jacks and pocket sevens is going to be discounted uh, each three card combinations because of the seven on the board here and the fact that we have a jack in our hand. And so that's going to give 54 total pocket pair combinations. He's going to have, you know, six ace ten suited and jack ten suited. I'd, I'd try... What I try to do is I try and group these by number of cards that are, you know, I guess, dominated, right? So, with Ace-10 and Jack-10, we each have, or there is each one card missing, right? So, there's the Ace on the flop here, and then there is a Jack in our hand. With 10-9 and 8-9, there are no cards missing. So, that's why there is a 4 in the spot and there's actually a 3 up here in the line above it. A hand like Ace-Jack actually has both the Ace and the Jack missing and as, as you can see I carefully placed the suits down here uh, to know that there are only two combinations of Ace-Jack present. Um, there is both the Ace, ace of Clubs, Jack of Clubs is, is missing and the Ace of Jack, Jack of Spades is missing because I have the Jack of Spades and the Ace of Clubs is on the flop. And the same can be true for Ace Queen suited, King Jack suited, and King King Queen suited. As you can see, there are both two blockers missing in each of that, which is why there's a two in this number here. Queen Jack suited, there's also only two, as I have the Queen of Hearts and the Jack of Spades. This would be actually be three if I had the Queen of Spades instead of the Queen of Hearts. And for each of our offsuit hands, there are only seven combinations. And the way I figured that was I multiplied the number of remaining aces and jacks, which there are three each, right? So there are only nine combinations total. And then subtract those by the number of suited, right? So if there are nine total minus two suited equals seven combinations of offsuit Broadway cards here. So three times seven is 21. You add up all these combinations, and you're going to get roughly 99, 99 different combinations he's going to have in his hand. So we'll continue. We know what this is hand range. Our, that was That's his hand range for continuing on the flop, right? So now we have to do the exact same thing that we just did with Ace, that we just did with his uh, pre-flop combinations. Uh, probably an easy way around to do this is just to subtract out twos through sixes. And the 10 9 suited and 9 8 suited, it looks like. Those are the only two that we're missing. Um, and essentially, we're going to be having 61 combinations that he's either calling or raising us on the flop. This is either his non folding combinations. So that we know that if he has 99 pre flop combinations and he's either calling or raising with 61 of them, we know that he's folding 38 and 38 divided by 99 is roughly a 38% fold equity. And, so if we have 30% fold equity, let's go ahead and, or sorry, fold percentage, let's go ahead and see how often, um, or what's our equity like when we do get called here in this situation. Uh, all I did was plug these hands in the poker stove. Us being in position here is a pretty big difference because we were able to take a free card the majority of the time. Uh, when when he calls now, he might equally just slow player his hand as often as he is raising it to in the situation so it's hard for us to really determine what hands he's going to raise us indefinitely and what hands he's not going to raise us um, what would make sense is that he might raise us only with like 
pocket sevens here, which would mean that he probably wouldn't raise this with any hand if the only hand he raises is sevens. So we're going to go ahead and uh, assert equity here when we are called, and we're going to go ahead and take a free card on the turn a lot of the time. So let's plug in our numbers and run through this equation. Um, the pot we've already figured out was 3 plus 3 plus 0.5 from the preflop, right? So we raised 3 in the cutoff, 3 in the big blind got called, plus the one small blind, which is a 6.5 total uh, big blinds. We already know that he's automatically folding 38.38 percentage points, and he's calling 61.62 percentage points, which is the one minus. We know our equity. We know how much. How, you know how often we lose. Uh, the when we do win, we're going to win the amount in the pot plus our C bet. All right. Let's just say we bank off our queen uh, on this board, or even we hit a ten. Um, now, this is assuming that we don't win anything implied odds when we actually hit our gut shot. The gut shot is really the only hand that we're actually going to get implied odds on um, when we can hit. There is going to be some, but we're also going to be losing some value as well when we do hit, and we can't get any value out of that hand. Like sevens, or, you know, I'm sorry, like pocket eights, pocket nines, and stuff. We're not going to get any value from those hands. And even when we do hit a hand, like, um, let's say we have Queen Jack, we hit our gut shot. If he hit, if he's calling us with King Jack, he's not going to give us any value. Same thing with, like, King Queen. So there's only a limited number of hands we get value from with our gut shot. That's actually pocket sevens. Um, and really, ace ten suited are the only two hands we're going to get a significant amount of value from. So we're going to assume that we get no implied odds here. We want to be conservative with our amount. So this is a bare minimum amount that we're going to win. And we're going to lose four big blinds here to our, when we make our C-bet. And we just go ahead and plug in our numbers in our, in our equation. We end up finding out that the EV of our C-bet on this board is actually 2.4 big blinds. So it's a pretty good, pretty good C-bet, right? So we're risking four big blinds to win 2.44 big blinds. This is why a lot of times I tell you guys to isolate up and C-bet a lot, just because the profitability of doing so is pretty big. Whereas, like, you know, we had to risk 27 big blinds for the 4-bet in order to win 4 to 5 big blinds. So comparatively, uh, risk-wise risk, risk -wise or so, this is going to be more plus EV than, say, the 4-bet would be. Now, let's go ahead and take another example here. Uh, now, you guys might think that, you know, 2, 3, and 4, uh, you know, 2, 3, 4, 2 suited might be a more profitable board to see bet than a hand like Ace-King-X, because we do have the gut shot. Um, well, we know what his range preflop is, right? Uh, and let's say that he's actually calling raising the flop now with, you know, the flush draw he's going to be doing with any gut shot, right? So any ace um, and pretty much any pair. He's not really going to be folding an over pair to us. So again, we need to recount the combinations, though, because it changes slightly um, because of the board texture. Uh, now there's only, like, one blocker out there for... All of the suited, all of the suited Broadway cards, uh, everything but Queen Jack suited. I think there actually is still only two Queen Jack suited here. Let me go ahead and change that. Okay, so I've changed that now. Uh, Queen Jack suited. There's two combinations of because we have the Queen of Hearts and the Jack of Spades, and these offsuit Broadways. There's only one blocker now for each one. Um, no, no longer two. So what we do is there, there are now four aces in the deck. 3 jacks, 4 times 3 is 12, minus the 3 suited ones for each combination equals 9 offsuit combinations for each. So if you were to add up all of these, hopefully you would get 104. And then you would go ahead and do the exact same thing for what he's going to be calling us, calling us with on the flop. Um, he's going to be calling us with like any pair, but now the two, pocket 2s, pocket 3s, pocket 4s, um, and pocket jacks now are all dominated. Uh, have one card, so there's only going to be four, uh, three combos each, and so there are 48 combinations of pocket pairs, six flush draw combinations of king queen, king jack, queen jack, jack ten ten nine nine eight. Um, he's going to have four of the ace ten suited combinations that are undominated by any cards, six of the uh, ace six suiteds, 
and then nine of the uh, offsuit aces. Uh, as you can see, he's now calling us with 82 combinations out of the possible 104. It's only going to give us a full percentage of 20.95%. Uh, as compared to before, we had uh, quite a bit more than that. So let's go ahead and give ourselves some equity here. You know, when we're betting, we're called in this situation. We don't have 0% equity. We have 17.4, uh, which is roughly just two overcards, right? Uh, two overcards that won't hit our opponent. So, you know, we could. Definitely not getting too many implied odds on, a, on an overcard hitting. Uh, so let's go ahead and plug and chug in our equation here. The pot's going to be the same. We have our fault percentage and our call percentage. We have our win percentage and our lose percentage. Uh, we know how much we're going to win. We know how much we're going to lose. So running through the math, we end up finding out that the EV of our C-bet here, which is not C-bet A, but in fact C-bet B, is 0.197 big blinds. Uh, compare that to the 2.1 some odd big blinds that we, we were winning for the CBA day, and you're going to see that we were actually much more profitable CBA in the first one than this one. Uh, so even though we actually had a little full equity and we had little uh, equity when we won, it still was actually a break-even CBA, right? Um, since we have some equity in the pot. Now if you have no equity in the pot, it's a little bit different. Let's say we had well, it's hard to have a hand like like that with, when you have absolutely no equity. Well, let's say you have like nine eight on and like ace king two board or something like that, or even like ace king ten board, and you have nine eight. There's really if your opponent calls you, you relatively have no chance of winning the hand. Um, so some boards are more positive than others, and. If you want to see about 100% of the time, I guess situations like that is it is somewhat profitable. Uh, I tend to not see it all the time because what, what's going to happen is you're just going to start like increasing your variance when you're risking uh, four big blinds to win, you know, a quarter, right? So that's the equivalent of risking four dollars to win a quarter. Uh, not a very good bet, I would say. I guess it, I guess it is a plus EV bet. Um, it's, I think it's largely a plus EV because we have. 17% um, equity in the pot, and I even think that is pushing it, because um, there are going to be chances where we do hit our jack and we're going to lose. Uh, we're going to lose more money than say, when than when we miss. Um, than say when we do hit our jack and get the value out of a hand. So, there's this is pretty much how you figure out the EV of a continuation. But uh, what you would do, let's say, on your own time, you you would go through. I want to explain this. You would make a little spreadsheet, and let's just say you have, you know, certain number of flops that you like to s calculate the, the value of a CBIT with on giving your opponent's range. You have your own hand, and you would just go through and you'd calculate the combinations for each and every single scenario, um, and and do that. Now you don't have to do it for you know 100 different times or whatever, until you get a feel for what board's going to be good to what board's the CBIT on. Um, in fact, let me go ahead and load up the spreadsheet that I have done um, quite a bit a long time ago, and, I've, and I have had my some of my coaching students create as well. Let me go ahead and do that right now. Okay, so I have gotten my spreadsheet up now. This is something that a lot of you guys, well, a lot of people that know me are going to laugh at because I kind of like spreadsheets and I like going through all this. Um, and basically what I did was I put in a bunch of different boards. If you want to see all the boards that I've done, First, calculating the value of a C bet. You know, look at this. Look at all these different boards. Isn't that crazy? Okay. And I've also done it with different hands. Right? I did it once with a hand like Ace Eight. Um, I did it once with Queen Jack. I think at that point I kind of figured out what, what was what's going on. Um, some of these are, you're going to see is in yellow. The ones that are in yellow. Let's see. This is the uh, EV of the C bet entirely. So all you do is these are all formulas. Um, this is the calculating the EV formula that we've already that we already did, um, and what I went ahead and did was substituted in, you know, when we let's say we have zero equity when called, right? Let's say uh, like on an Ace Five Four rainbow board we have Queen Jack offsuit. When we get called, I pretty much assume that we have 
very little, if any, equity in our hand. Um, but it's not necessarily true. Well, because we have 19% equity, so what I would do is I would go ahead and plug in zero. If we have zero equity, you know, does it make it a profitable C bet or not? Um, and if the number is negative, then I would tag it yellow, and I would mark these boards as the boards not profitable to C bet against a tag. And it's kind of interesting to think that like an ace five four rainbow board isn't profitable to do so against a reg. Um, the reason is because he's never folding a pair, and he's got a lot of ace x hands in his hand range, of which he's not folding. And when it's suited, it's even more so not going to happen because he's now not folding ever his flush draws. Uh, so keep that in mind. And you're going to see like, look at all the uh, ace jack ten two rainbow board when we have a hand like ace eight, you know. The repo reason why people say that it's not a profitable board to see, but is just because our opponent is, is just going to call us with a ton of hands that he has in his range. So this is just something that I've done. Uh, I've spent a few hours on. Uh, as you can see, I've got other spreadsheets down here too that I've done a lot of work on. Um, maybe I'll get to them sometime in the the future. Probably not in this lecture series. Maybe in others. But. I do recommend you guys doing this, especially if you're interested more in continuation betting. Um, hopefully this has helped you guys out a lot. So I'm going to go ahead and minimize this and get back to our lecture here. Uh, to, the, to finish off our lecture, this is what we've done today. We figured out the EV of a river bluff. We did some 4-bet bluffing combinations. And we did the EV of a C-bet. I know this is a lot of EV talk and um, probably seems a lot of it it's just kind of confusing or like mush to some of you guys who aren't familiar with the EV equation but um, hopefully you guys can see the theory behind a lot of this and, and why I go through the math behind my plays uh, it helps me explain my my methods a little bit more rather than just saying just because it's profitable I like to show you guys why it's profitable and hopefully you know if you guys can figure out why something is profitable from the very base level you guys can improve on that your own so if you guys have any any questions on any of this, please feel free to ask. Hopefully this is helpful. Uh, what we're going to be doing the next lecture series um, is still going to be pretty pretty much like up in the air, right? I mean, these are all the things that you guys have talked to me about either in in person or on the forum. Something that you guys would like to see um, more things on. I can't say we're going to be covering all of these topics or any of these topics because I'm, I'm really up in the air. I'm, I think I'm going to be doing another lecture series through the end, end, the end of the series, probably another live or another like hand history replay section too uh, to go to go through it. Um, but let's just say you guys can expect something like this of these along these lines for the next uh, and final uh, lecture video at the end of the series. So Guys, this has been Code Red Rules. I know this has been uh, a nice, long, and probably uh, boring lecture, but hopefully you guys learned something, and uh, otherwise, good luck at the tables.